Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. It has been an incredible 2019 so far here on our channel. We have had some outstanding content-filled shows and some controversial guests who were asked some very tough questions and put on the spot in regards to today's economic, social, and political environments. One of our most explosive interviews so far this year has been with former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, who talked very openly about 9-11. She detailed her own personal experience behind the scenes. As a sitting Congresswoman, Cynthia encountered fierce opposition to her request for an investigation into the truth of what actually happened and what she says is truly shocking. My interview with Cynthia McKinney can be found on our channel and our free matching report is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash C. Joining us today is Mr. Craig Hemke. Craig is an expert in the field of finance and precious metals. He is the publisher and editor of tfmetalsreport.com, which is a very large online community for precious metals investors. Craig, welcome to the show. How are you today? Well, I'm fine, Michelle. Thank you very much for the opportunity to visit with you. I've been looking forward to it. This is going to be fun. Craig, one of the first topics that we'd like to start off with is something we know that you find very important. It's the topic of precious metals paper contracts and paper trading desks in London and New York City. We'd like to hear your perspective on what is happening behind the scenes and for anyone who may have never been exposed to the research of data.org, which covers gold and silver manipulation. Please explain to us exactly how the price suppression can occur within the world of precious metals. What are the mechanics of this activity behind the scene, especially with big banks? Well, the key thing to understand, Michelle, is that the price of gold and the price of silver is determined not through the physical exchange of physical gold or silver, you know, for fiat currency. It's, it's instead determined through the trading of derivatives, which offer, I guess we'll call it an exposure to precious metals because there's, they're certainly not backed by anything. The owners of the derivative never expect to take delivery and the issuers of the derivative never expect to make delivery. And so that's the first thing that people need to understand. This system came about then after uh, the last attempt to manage price through physical metal dissolved in the late 1960s. I invite anybody to look up the term London gold pool. Uh, just type that into Google and see what you find. And you'll see that that was a consortium, if you will, of eight countries, including the United States, that pledged physical gold into the London marketplace and use that physical gold to maintain the price of gold at $35 an ounce. Again, we're talking back in the 1960s. Demand was so great and so many dollars were out in the world and with the, uh, the dollars being exchangeable for physical gold, eventually there was a run on all of that gold that was pledged in to uh, keep price stable. And the London gold pool dissolved in 1968. Well, and then that was the last time that price was actually determined through physical trading because that was no longer tenable uh, a scheme was concocted in the mid 1970s and on december 31st 1974 which is uh, obviously not a coincidence that on january 1 1975 u.s citizens were allowed to own physical gold again after about a 40-year prohibition on december 31 1974 uh, comex futures trading began uh, anybody can do some research and find out that the goal of beginning futures trading was to tamp down physical demand. And now you look at it, uh, really, there's very little physical trading of gold that actually takes place as gold now has been uh, substituted with all these other different forms, whether it's forward contracts promissory notes, futures contracts, and these other derivatives, even uh, things like the GLD serve as substitutes for owning the real thing. They've, in a sense, uh, done some actual 20th and 21st century alchemy, Michelle, where, you know, the wizards of old would try to turn lead and other things into gold. Well, that's actually now 
what these bankers have done. They've turned uh, paper contracts, digital derivatives into gold and that the world assumes that a, uh, a digital contract is just as good as gold when it's, when it's not. So the banks have the control over the creation of these contracts as they're traded in New York. The banks have the control over the uh, whatever's left of a physical market that's in London, and they are the ones that uh, control the market forces really on a daily basis. And I've heard from many experts out there that the amount of paper contracts so far outnumbers the amount of physical gold that actually exists on the earth that it's, it's somewhat laughable. Exactly. There are, I mean, nobody knows for sure. I mean, whether even if it's only 10 uh, beneficial owners for every actual physical ounce, uh, that's enough to finally break the system when all of those o owners actually want physical delivery. For now, it's, it's kind of a fractional reserve system, uh, sort of like your bank. I think a lot of people have probably seen, you know, for example, like It's a Wonderful Life at, at Christmas time. And there's a scene there where uh, George and Mary are getting married and getting ready for their honeymoon when all of a sudden there's a run on the bank and everybody shows up at the Bailey building alone wanting their money right now. Mm -hmm. And George has to explain to them that I can't do that. You know, your money's in Bob's house and your money's in Martha's house. But here, I'll give you 10% of your money. You can come back, you know, in 90 days and we'll give you the rest. Well, that's still how your bank operates. Uh, you might be able to go in and withdraw uh, your cash today from your bank out of your savings account. But actually, if you try to take out more than $10,000, you're going to have to jump through all sorts of hoops. It's all a fractional reserve system. And that's how the gold market operates as well. Uh, if folks that think they own gold actually own most likely some type of unallocated account, a promise of future delivery. And as long as those owners uh, feel confident that, well, if I really need my gold, I can get it then the system perpetuates and continues. What ultimately happens though, is because there are so many owners of that same ounce in this fractional reserve system, if all those owners ever show up at the same time and say, no, 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 no. Like those folks at, uh, in It's a Wonderful Life in the lobby of the Bailey Building and Loan, if they all say, no, 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 I want my, my gold now. No, 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 I don't, I'm not gonna wait 60 days. I'm not gonna wait 90 days. That's when ultimately there will be a problem for these banks that have created the system and that main, maintain it. That is an extraordinary analogy. You know what? I, as many times as I've watched It's a Wonderful Life, I've never made the connection between what the banks are actually doing and what that movie shows us. Right. And, that, and that's exactly this fractional reserve and derivative pricing scheme is what still holds today. It was, it was instituted, like I said, 40, coming up on 44 years ago. And it continues, uh, much to my chagrin and everybody else who invests in precious metals, because we know that if, if price were to be determined solely on the supply and demand of physical metal, you know, and it was just a one-to-one -one relationship, um, the price wouldn't be $1,300 an ounce. And so we all look forward to the day when the system finally breaks and it reverts back to that sort of price discovery. Now, when it does revert back to the price discovery of where it actually should be, what's that number from your perspective? You know, Michelle, I, I get asked it a lot. I've been asked it a lot over the last 10 years. And frankly, I, I, I can't give you that number. A lot of folks will say, well, you know, the total M2 money supply is X. And the uh, alleged amount that the U.S. holds in its vaults is Y. And so, therefore, X divided by Y nets us $13,000 an ounce. Um, okay, fine. I, here's the problem, though, and it's exactly what we just described. We don't know why. And what I mean by that is we don't know that variable because nobody knows how much actual physical gold there is in the world that has clear, free title um, because of the system, because of the way the system has been designed, run, managed over the last 45 years. So since we don't know the denominator, since we don't know how much actual gold there is, it's impossible then to give you a price per ounce because it's, you know, it's per ounce. And we don't know how many ounces there are. You know, the Chinese tell us they only have 2,000 ounces or something like that in their official reserves. Well, nobody believes that. 
And uh, it's probably at least 10 times that one, especially when you factor in how much gold is owned by the Chinese public and, you know, throughout the country. And so we just simply don't know how much, uh, again, free, clear title, clear providence uh, gold there is. And so therefore, if you don't know how many ounces there are, it's impossible to say what the proper dollar price bounce is. Now, while this paper leveraging trading is happening, mine production for gold is on course to be cut in half by the year 2025. And that is an enormous cut. Billionaire Sam Zell, at the age of 77, has invested in gold for the first time in his career. And he says, it is simply due to this fact. Talk to us about why central banks are buying so much gold. What is behind the record amount of gold purchases on their part? Well, uh, to your first point, yeah, mine production is falling and it's falling in silver too because price has made it uneconomical to produce gold and silver. It's just too damn expensive. Uh, And with the environmental regulations and everything else that goes with it, if you're only going to be able to sell your silver for $15 an ounce, I mean, the math just doesn't work. And so mines get shuttered, mines get put on maintenance and supply naturally falls. Now in a normal market then, you'd say, well, supply is falling and demand is picking up, therefore price has to respond. But again, price is determined through the trading of these derivatives, which have no link to the physical metal. So therefore you get this kind of falling amount of global supply due to this uh, unfairly determined price. To your second point about central banks, look it, it, the, think of the, look at the, who the central banks are that's buying uh, gold. It is primarily the dollar creditor nations, meaning nations like China or India. Remember, we used to call them the BRICS. Uh, Those are the countries that were the dollar creditors. They produce the stuff and the Americans buy it. And so in exchange for the products, these companies, these countries, I should say, get dollars in return. And so now all of a sudden they've got dollar reserves. Traditionally, those dollars have been recycled back into treasuries, providing a bid for the bond market and keeping U.S. interest rates low. But the jig is up, man. Uh, Michelle, you and I see this, so I can assure you that people far smarter than I in uh, Russia, China, uh, India, and the like, they understand what's going on here, that the U.S. is at the end or very near the end of this Ponzi scheme. Uh, that they run in terms of their money supply and their monetary policy. And so therefore they are doing what all of us should be doing. They are taking their dollar reserves that they've accumulated. And instead of just simply buying treasuries and keeping things in dollars, they're diversifying out and they're taking their dollars and they're buying gold. The Russians now are averaging 20 or 30 tons a month that they're buying. They're now the number five largest holder, uh, sovereign holder in the world that we know about the Chinese. We talk about that. The Indian demand, uh, even the reserve bank of India is officially buying gold again for the first time in years. Um, and at the end of the day, this just, this is a lesson for all of us because you, me, uh, everybody else that works and saves in dollars, we essentially hold dollar reserves too. And so if, uh, if these people, you know, these other central banks and again, around the world are swapping out dollar reserves, at least partially, for hard assets, physical metal like gold and silver. Well, geez, I mean, I certainly think that's something to be a smart strategy for you and I and everybody else. It's a signal, Craig. (laughs) No doubt about it. Now, focusing in upon silver, it's everybody's favorite little precious metal that's always supposed to rocket higher, but it seems to be on its own timeline regarding when it actually rallies. Essentially, silver seems to now trade on a par with oil trades. Since oil is the main expense for miners, when their costs for energy go up, the price of silver seems to rise also, some kind of a mirror effect. Do you agree with this observation or do you see another catalyst for it? Well, there's there's something to that at least because silver traditionally has responded to inflation pressures, um, and so you look at the you know key component to inflation is energy costs, and if energy costs are rising, then you would think silver would rise. So there's there is something to that, but I mean let's be frank. I mean this is silver has been just killing all of us now for the better part of six seven years, 
uh, price broke down through tr- uh, an important support level near $26 and almost exactly six years ago. And it has almost done nothing since. In fact, it's almost trended lower, regardless of those uh, physical supply, physical demand issues. But, but Michelle, the, the key to understanding silver is that, you know, price has been smashed backward and, and continues to trend lower. But it's not about physical supply and demand. It's about the supply and the demand is derivative. And as we discussed earlier, it's that derivative trading that sets price. I mean, right now, this year, the entire free world, including Russia and China, will produce about, oh, let's call it 875 million ounces of silver. If you take Russia and China out because China doesn't export any and Russia uses most of it, we're talking a number closer to 750 million ounces. As we speak, the total open interest of contracts on the COMEX in New York is about 220,000 contracts. Well, each contract represents 5,000 ounces. Doing the math, that's 1.1 billion, billion with a B, ounces of digital silver that it trades on the COMEX. Well, now, silver's in a supply deficit, and it, it all gets consumed every year. How can then the futures market have volume of digital derivatives that's one and a half times, one and a half times the annual mine supply? Okay. So that's, that's, where the, that's where the problem lies, is that the price is determined through these derivative contracts. And then you got to look at who issues the derivative contracts and the concentration of position, which is amazingly just ignored by analysts that just say, well, it's a free market. You've got to be some lunatic if you think otherwise. Um, the, in the data that comes out from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, every week, you can look at the concentration of positions. And on the short side, four banks hold almost half of the position. Okay, that's, that's monopolistic right there. So you have a pricing mechanism that are monopolistically controlled by a collection of banks. And so therefore, uh, price continues to trend in the direction that they want to go. And when they can just simply issue contracts taking the short side against the speculators who want the long side every time technically the picture improves, then all the banks have to do is roll the price over, break down the technical pattern again, like they just have recently done. All those speculators that bought silver exposure on the COMEX, hoping for the upside, all rush rush to the exits at once. And then the cycle begins anew. And in the meantime, prices kind of cycles between about 15 and 17. And the only people consistently making money are the banks. (laughs) But that's how it works in 2019. Do you think that they're just going to keep holding it there between 15 and 17? Because it seems like that's where it's stuck. Yeah, I think that's what the banks want to do. Um, I, I've done the math before in that how, you know, how simple is it for, let's just call it one bank trading desk, to like, uh, like JP Morgan, for example, to when price is rising over the course of a $2 rally to issue, say, 20,000 new contracts taking the short side and offering them to a, a group of hedge funds taking the long side. But then when price rolls back over and you can crash it back down and say cover that entire 20,000 contract short position for a $1 profit, that's $100 million. If you could do that once a quarter, that's $400 million for your trading desk. Say maybe you don't even make a buck, you make 50 cents on average doing this just sucking in the specs by stepping back and letting the price run up and get above the 200 day moving average, get everybody all excited. And then, you know, pull the rug out from under everybody, let it crash back down, cover all those shorts and start the game again. That's how these banks operate, right? I mean, no bank sets out to just make one time gains, right? The, even at the, just the basic bank level, they want to borrow short, lend long and keep the spread. So it's consistent money, right? Consistent uh, earnings quarter after quarter. So if you're a bank trading desk with complete monopolistic control of something like silver, man, playing this game for 50, 100 million bucks a quarter, that keeps your bonus pool pretty fat. And uh, sadly, that's, that's just the way the system is. Too many people benefit from the system, so they don't even want to question it. And it continues until it finally, the, like, as we said, the only thing that can break it is physical demand. 
that calls these people to the carpet for immediate delivery and then breaks the back of the system. Um, until that happens, yeah, we're, we're kind of stuck with it. Wow. It's just so absurd that something like this can be going on because, you know, as you mentioned, if we know it, if you know it, and I know it because you're telling me it, um, certainly many, many folks that are higher up than us know it, and there's no one overseeing this. This is what's yeah. incredible. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, in fact, the regulators are complicit. I believe in allowing this to happen. Uh, the, the evidence is right there in front of the CFTC. I've actually been part of a, we'll just loosely call it a group that uh, back in 2012 presented to the CFTC direct evidence of this happening. And all they ever did was sweep it under the rug. And, and this was while they had an ongoing investigation of manipulation and silver. When we finally kind of tried to bring some closure to this and some publicity to it, the uh, the uh, the investigation that they'd had gone going for five years was quickly, like the very next day, uh, closed and ended. And uh, since then, some of the commissioners have come out uh, and said, well, you know, uh, we just couldn't really prove anything, but we all know what's going on. I uh, look, um, uh, all anybody has to do is look at the history since the financial crisis. And note that no banker, you know, whether it's a commercial banker or investment banker, no banker has ever been jailed for a far greater series of crimes and fraud than you see in the silver market. And if, if they're going to be able to allow to skate on what they did 10 years ago and how they just stole from uh, the Treasury through TARP and all of the other QE programs that were initiated, and nobody ever went to jail, nobody was ever convicted of anything. Well, then, geez, it's kind of silly to think that the regulators would then crack down on these same banks for something like silver. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Now, when you mentioned that you were part of a group that took it to the CFTC, tell everybody what the CFTC is. Well, that's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. It's a government agency charged with oversight uh, of the futures markets. Now, and that's just not gold and silver. I mean, we're talking, you know, oil and treasury bonds and interest rates and everything else that goes with it. And they're like any other government agency. I mean, it's just a bunch of bureaucrats and bean counters and a handful of investigators. Um, they would make the excuse that they are so strapped that they just simply can't pay attention. They don't have the resources to fully investigate <laughs> and, and regulate the uh, companies that they are charged with monitoring. And, and frankly, that's not un unusual even. Uh, if people have followed, say, for example, the opioid crisis, so 60 Minutes has documented how, how the FDA has been totally co-opted by the drug companies that they are meant to regulate. And so you see this at the CFTC as well, investigators and legal counsel just kind of flipping back and forth between the government and these firms and lobbying firms that they're meant to regulate. And uh, again, it's just simply a captured, if not complicit regulator. So I sure as heck uh, uh, would dispel the notion for anybody listening that somehow uh, the CFTC or even the Department of Justice is gonna bring us some level of redemption or fix these markets. I mean, like I said, if they weren't gonna do it in 2008 to Dick Fold and, and uh, all those uh, Lloyd Blank Fine and the rest, I mean, they're not going to do it in 2019 either. The only thing that's going to fix this for us is a renewed financial crisis that leads to uh, a flight away from the dollar, a lack of confidence in the, in the current system as it is, and then sudden, uh, uh, relentless demand for physical metal the banks then prove that they don't have the metal to back up all of this exposure and derivatives that they've issued. And then their, their, you know, their system collapses. Who oversees the overseers? Who oversees the CFTC or is there no one? Uh, Michelle, that's the problem. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, a cycle, uh, you know, kind of a circular uh, regulatory uh, construct, if you will, uh, because there is nobody uh, to hold these people to account, uh, as we as we just discussed. Um, 
uh, the uh, Treasury officials, uh, SEC, uh, Department of Justice, CFT, uh, the CFTC, no one uh, has taken an interest in moving forward with this. Now, we've seen some class action cases finally uh, go to trial. And in the discovery process, we're getting uh, information now that proves, you know, we get the emails, the text messages between traders about how they rig and collude together to impact price, even on a daily basis for their benefit. I mean, that's all part of the public record now, but yet that's where it stops. Um, Nobody ever takes it and goes, oh, hey, this might be something worth looking into. Again, because these banks have been deemed to be too big to fail, too systemically important to keeping, you know, the entire Ponzi scheme afloat now. No no, uh, extra, you know, no repeat of the financial crisis is going to be allowed they're going to do everything they can to stave that off. And so there's no way that any government regulator is going to be allowed uh, by their higher ups to take the steps necessary to uh, initiate a breakdown of these markets. Um, they're just not going to take any chances. And so these regulators are going to continue to look the other way. At the end of the day, where this ultimately benefits you and I, everybody listening, and then uh, the Chinese, the Russians, and everybody else that is buying physical metal at these inexpensive prices. Um, that's really all we can do. I mean, we can, we can recognize the fraud, the scam of the system, and then use it to your advantage. Just continue to be patient, buying physical metal at these deeply discounted prices. Use that as your financial protection for these calamities that are certainly still coming. And just know that you've done your best to uh, protect yourself, protect your family, protect your, Uh, net worth, your investments, everything else. Uh, Physical gold and silver is about the best way to do it. And uh, if anything, they've given us time to continue to implement that plan. Exactly. Take it and look on the bright side and take advantage of this moment in time. Now, you know, Craig, for our final question, I want to turn to politics and President Trump. Is the president a shoo-in for re-election, in your opinion? And if he wins, what are the objectives that he will look to accomplish during his second term? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so much of the economic growth over the last couple of years has been due to this change of presidential leadership. You know, the market was anticipating, you know, all this deficit spending and uh, you know, higher interest rates, a stronger dollar because of economic growth and tax cuts and everything that went with it. And now that agenda has been thwarted uh, with the divided Congress and you're not going to get anything going forward, whether uh, a second term of President Trump would would be uh, able to uh, kind of reignite everything that got started in 2017. We'd have to see because you have to have control of Congress at the same time. That would appear as tenuous at this time, whether to be able to pull that off. And then additionally, I, second term presidents. I mean, almost as soon as they take the oath of office the second time, analysts and pundits start referring to them as lame ducks, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure. Can, will he be reelected? Gosh, looking at the uh, field of opposition to him at this point, it's almost impossible to see anybody beating him <laughs> because they're doing, they're doing, I mean, that motley crew uh, on the other side. And, and really, nobody is offering any alternative that appeals to the very same people you know, the, the Trump Democrats, if you will, that elected him in the first place. So uh, anything can happen between now and then. But even if Trump is reelected, I just wonder if if he'll have the political capital or the congressional majorities that he'll be able to do anything. Hmm. So you think his second term may not be as explosive as his first. Right. Exactly. Or at least that first year and a half, maybe, where all of a sudden the U.S. economy improved and consumer and business confidence improved and there were tax cuts and all this other stuff. Um, A lot of other things are now working against them. And uh, these trillion dollar deficits, as far as the eye can see, regardless who was the president. And I think all of that um, is a a pretty serious drag. That little bit of euphoria, if you will, uh, has worn off and probably isn't coming back. You know what? Before we go, one quick question. On the topic of unfunded liabilities of pension funds, Craig, do you foresee another federal bailout? Uh, You're seeing it almost on a daily basis, right? 
all of this uh, rate cuts and liquidity injections, everything else, trying to keep the stock market afloat. And the reason that's important is because, as you said, these underfunded pensions, both at the state, the public, private level, um, it used to be back in the day that pension funds, insurance companies were able to buy fixed income securities, which are considered to be safe and not necessarily risk free, but less risky than equities. But that was back when you could get five, six, seven percent in interest every year. Now to meet all their growth assumptions, you know, for actuarially for how, what they got to pay out, you can't keep up by owning fixed income anymore. So these pension funds, uh, both public and private, are pushed more into equities and other risky investments. And Fed knows that. That's all part of the reason why they do everything they can, fighting tooth and nail to keep the stock market afloat. Because uh, you know, not only would another 30 to 50 percent stock market crash like we had in 2001 and 2008 decimate, you know, private IRAs and 401ks. It would just absolutely crush those those uh, pension plans. So, yeah, that's just a, that's still a problem hanging out there. But it's all part of what the Fed, the ECB, uh, the Bank of Japan, that they're all swimming against doing everything they can to, you know, to keep those plates spinning. All very interesting topics that we're just going to have to keep an eye on and, and watch this <laughs> point in history. No doubt about it, Michelle. Craig, this has been an amazing interview. Please tell everyone how they can follow your work. We've had uh, tfmetalsreport.com uh, going for almost nine years now. And it's a vibrant online community of folks that, that can see all this coming. Um, we're all of different political strides from people all around the world, but we all recognize that we're in the same boat at this point. So we're all there to help each other. I just encourage everybody to check it out. I think it's unlike any other online community. Again, tfmetalsreport.com. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. Michelle, it's my pleasure. Mr. Craig Hemke, expert in the world of precious metals. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.